Welcome to Grace Church as we celebrate the victory of our resurrected Savior, Jesus Christ. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we hope that today you have an encounter with God's great love that is revealed in Jesus. If you're joining us in person, please note there are exits on either side of the stage or through the back doors of the sanctuary. And if you need use of our restrooms while you're with us, they are located out the same back doors just across the lobby. If today's your first time with us, please meet with one of our awesome welcome team members wearing the orange name tags. They have a little gift for you. We also have a gift for every family that has joined us today. As you exit through the lobby, we would like you to receive one of our potted flowers to bring home as a reminder in the weeks ahead that Jesus is alive and now reigns as our King in heaven. Because today we celebrate, today we join with voices of people all around the world. We join with the voices of heaven declaring that Jesus Christ is victorious. He has taken our guilt, our sin, our shame. He took our death, but the grave could not defeat him. The grave could not defeat him because he rose. And now he reigns as the right hand of the Father. He has taken us from death to life. He is the Son of God. He is the King of Kings. He is our rock and solid foundation. He is the name above every other name. He is Jesus. He is the only one worthy of our praise. So let all of creation, let all of God's earth, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. 
Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let everything that has breath. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I praise in the valley. I praise on the mountain. I praise in I'm sure. I praise when I'm down. I praise when I know. I praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water, my enemies drowning. Carry 
that kind of weight He was my too Till I met you And I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried it was my time till I met you. And then you called my name and I ran out of that grave. Out of the darkness into your glory. our story this is our testimony I need to rescue I need to rescue my sin was heavy but chains break at the weight of your glory I needed shelter I was an orphan now you call me a citizen of heaven Let's take a seat. The amazing opportunity that we have this morning as we've been talking and building up to the theme for today, Easter, the resurrection, of course, but going from death to life is to have the honor to have individuals getting baptized, to tell the story through their simple actions of the resurrection in itself and the part of their life, the sin part of their life being put to death and then being raised again with Jesus. And so we always want people to understand what baptism really is before they see it happen because there's nothing mystical about baptism. Baptism is not what saves you. You're saved by grace and faith alone. But when you come to the waters, water was representative back then when the Bible was originally written. It was looked at as the plane of life. And so when it was something was under the water, it was representing death. 
And then when it comes back out, it, it represents a new life. And so there's two kind of folds to it. Is one is when someone goes under the water, they're dying to their old sinful self. They're telling the story that Jesus has given them hope to die to that sin. And when they come out of the water, they live a new life in Christ. But it also tells the story of the resurrection, of Good Friday, Jesus' death, and his resurrection so that we may have a new life in Christ and live with a hope that we previously did not have. And so this morning, we're excited to have a couple individuals come and share that story with you together as a community. And so the first individual that we have in the tank today is Israela DiPilato. And she's in here and she's actually gonna be getting baptized by her dad. And so for a couple of years, she's been kind of thinking about this and she's been go they've been going here for about two or three years. And she just felt like, you know what? This is my time. This is finally time for me to take this step. And so we're excited to be able to celebrate with her today. As you know, you have accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. <laughs> and you promised to serve him all the rest of your days? Yeah. baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And you know, sometimes we have the opportunity and honor to have a family affair together, and so... Israel's sister, Aria, is about to get into the tank, and she's actually getting into the tank with her mom. And so Aria, when I talked to her beforehand, because, you know, it can be scary just to be up here in general. That's what's a barrier for a lot of individuals who you might be sitting out there and you think, that's why I don't want to do it. I don't like being in front of people. But she shared with me before that she feels like she just wants to be a child of God and a follower of Jesus. And so that is why she is taking this step to get baptized today. Aria, is Jesus the Lord of your life? Yes. Do you promise to serve him all the days of your life? Yes. <laughs> then I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> And we continue on, and we have the honor of having Lindsay Broomfield get into the tank, and she has Tom Broomfield, who is jumping in with her. And so she has been coming to Grace really since about 2013. And her husband's family, she married into the Broomfield family. If you've been around Grace for a minute, you know that they have been here the whole time. And so really, as they were seeking, you know, we want our faith to not just be my family's names, faith, all these different things. So they spent some time here, Grace, but then they actually said, you know, we want this to be our own. So they started to look at other churches because that's important is to find the space that God has you. And part of their story is that they found, even after looking at other churches, that they weren't at Grace because the Broomfields go to Grace. They were at Grace because this is where God had them. And so after that time, she feels, you know what? It's after all this time, of having faith and being in church, we've shed that, and I now feel like I have that permission, like it's for me to get baptized, not the Broomfield name, but for me to do it, and so we're excited about having her. It is exciting to be here, and uh, Lindsay, uh, you know, but many of you may not know, I'm not a very excitable person. <laughs> <laughs> but when uh, Lindsay told me, or I heard that she wanted to be baptized, I was really excited. And that, that's uh, just a, a wonderful thing. So, Lindsay, as I thought about this, I wanted to share something with you. I, I uh, picked a book of uh, Matthew chapter 6, which starts off by saying Jesus is he, he's telling us not to worry about life. And it's, a good, it's good for all of us to think about that, not to worry about things. And he goes on to tell how the birds of the air and the 
the flowers in the field that they don't, uh, God provides for them and how much more he's going to provide for you. The, the verse, the chapter ends with saying each day has enough trouble of its own, but again, not to worry. But then there's a verse just before that that starts with the big word, but, and it says, but to seek God and his righteousness and the rest of it will be taken care of. He will provide for you. So I, I want you to remember that verse. It's a very important one. It's meant a lot to me over the years. So I'm going to ask you, have you put your faith in the Lord Jesus? Yes. And do you want to follow him and look after his righteousness, uh, his righteous ways all the days of your life? Yes. Well, Lindsay, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, for our last baptism today, who my daughter has is, is decided to take the step of baptism. And so in talking with her, and I, say, I share this because other parents out there try to figure out when is the right time, when is not. And you know what? My answer is I'm not entirely sure. But she initiated this experience out of something that she wanted to do. And we set up these little jumping kind of hurdles for her of like, okay, you've got to go to the class and you know what, we're going to, if you still want to do it, remind us in a couple weeks. You know, we set up these little hurdles and she jumped each one. And so between the heart of that is we don't want to slow her down either because even with her sharing, and, and she wants to say something too this morning, is that her life reflects her walk of faith. And so I am excited this morning to have both my wife, Bethany, in here to baptize, to baptize her with me. And uh, with that, I think she has something she's going to share. The reason I want to be baptized is because I feel like God is calling me to do it. Penny, have you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Yes. And do you promise to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. Well, Penny, after being baptized, I know that you also, your life will reflect this story just like it is right now. And so it is my honor and privilege as your daddy to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Join me as I pray over the people that got baptized. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this uh, testimony of death to life. Lord, everyone that has taken that step today and that will take that step uh, throughout our service today, Lord, I pray that your hand of blessing will be on them. Lord, the, the, the walk of faith, this, this journey of faith is not easy, but Lord, you are with us. Lord, I pray for your Holy Spirit to fill these individuals. That as they walk through life, they come through good things and bad things. That the Holy Spirit will guide them. That they will give glory and honor to you in everything of life. Lord, watch their steps. Guide their path. Guide them in paths of righteousness. For your name's sake we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand, let's keep singing, let's worship the Lord.
The grave is empty. Darkness has been defeated. And Jesus is risen. He is risen. What glory, what hope we all get to enjoy. Please take a seat this morning. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here, joining with us to celebrate our risen season, our risen Jesus. If you are new with us today, welcome. It's great to have you with us. Our regular church family, we love celebrating Jesus together, and it's so good to be here. Just briefly this morning, we wanted to let you know two things that are related. As a church family, we're going to be taking steps into our journey of prayer with God in the next few weeks. And on Sunday mornings, our regular services are at 9 and 1045. And Pastor Mark's going to be preaching through a series, Praying with the Psalms. It's going to be a really awesome series of connecting with God and really experiencing the breadth of emotion experience that the psalmist, often David, went through and how he expressed those back to God. And then on Wednesday evenings, if you're able, we're going to be doing a class called How to Pray. And if you're a prayer and maybe you just feel like, yeah, I could do with a bit of refreshing in my prayer life, some new ideas of how to pray. Or maybe you're new to prayer or have many questions about prayer. This will be a time to really just explore those in a very practical way to take steps growing in prayer. And we'll be talking about our own journey of prayer with God as a conversational relationship, as well as praying for others, people who know Jesus already and people who don't know Jesus yet, and just really asking God to reveal to us what His purpose and plans are for our lives. So we're excited about that journey of prayer, and we invite everyone to participate with us and really ask God, what is some of your next steps of prayer through this season that we're going through? And now as Pastor Mark's going to come up to pray, uh, to preach, I'm just going to pray for him, but pray for us too. As we're celebrating Jesus, we remember that all our lives are an act of worship. We have life because he is risen from the dead. And so let's just pray, worship, and celebrate together this morning. Lord Jesus, it just thrills our hearts to know that you are alive and that you have made your life known to us. You've given us new life, and just as we saw these folk being baptized and their journey going from death to life, we thank you for that experience that we have received. And I just pray for each person here that they would know the freedom of being forgiven and set free, and the power, the resurrection power of walking with you in our lives. And so, Lord, as we bring our lives in worship, we bring our offerings, we bring all that we are. We thank you, Lord Jesus, that you come and meet with us, that we will hear your voice. And so as Pastor Mark preaches, we pray that you'd give him words and help us to hear through your spirit the words that you want to speak directly to every one of us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Barry. He is risen. Okay, that was, you get a C plus. That's about C. He is risen. He is risen. All right. It's been... Uh, quite the morning already, and truthfully, and I say this every time we witness a baptism, there's no sermon that will be able to match what you just saw, because what you just saw was a living example of the gospel of Jesus Christ, how God has reached and touched hearts and changed lives. How God, by his mercy and grace, drew people, forgave them, was merciful to them, giving them new life. This Easter Sunday, we conclude a journey that's been a week long. We started on Palm Sunday, understanding that Jesus, or looking at the story of Jesus riding into the heart of the nation of Israel, riding into the heart of the city of Jerusalem, right into the temple. And we made this observation that even today, 2,000 years later, Jesus is still riding into hearts and changing lives. And so we celebrate. And then we move to Good Friday. Well, we not just saw, we, did, we saw the, just the, not only the cause of salvation in Jesus, but we saw the cost of our salvation. He suffered and he died to pay for our sin. 
your sin, my sin. All of our junk, as I like to say, was cast on him on the cross. And if you're following that this weekend, you know that, for me especially, after Good Friday, Saturday is weird. Because on Good Friday, we sort of leave things like unresolved. Jesus died for the sins, but he's dead. He's in the tomb. But then comes Easter Sunday and the realization that he is no longer in the tomb. And because he has defeated death, now we can have eternal life. And that's the victory that we celebrate on Easter morning. So today I want to be brief with you and just sort of walk through what you've seen in baptism and walk through what the gospel is and why we so desperately need to embrace all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ. So I'm going to invite you to stand for the reading of the word. I'm going to read just a few verses from the gospel of John chapter 5. I'll read from verse 21 and then I'll skip down to verse 24 and 25. And we're just going to walk this through together. And my hope and my prayer is simply this, that for some that are listening that are familiar and that have embraced the gospel and you are followers of Jesus, I hope that this will once again re-inspire you to give your all to Jesus Christ, our Savior. And then there are those amongst us who are watching also online, good morning, that perhaps you're just not sure about what you believe in, who you believe in. You don't know a whole lot about this Jesus character. And my prayer for you is that you would just lean in a little and listen. And as you listen, that God would speak to your heart. And maybe even perhaps this Easter Sunday, draw you to faith in Jesus. John chapter 5, verse 21. Hear now the word of God. Jesus speaks and says, For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. Verse 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. God's word for us this morning. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we thank you once again for your presence in this place. We ask now in these few minutes as we meditate on your word, as we consider all that you are and all that you've done for us in Jesus, I pray open our eyes that we might see your beauty, your glory, your goodness. That we might behold how merciful you are and gracious you are and forgiving you are. That we might understand just a little bit deeper. That we might embrace a little bit more fully our Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord, for not leaving us to ourselves, but loving us so much that you sent your only son, that whosoever would believe on him would have everlasting life. We are thankful and we worship you in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And all of God's people said, give somebody a high five and you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I just realized that the sun came out right through our stained glass, which makes a magnificent picture for Easter Sunday morning. I had nothing to do with that. That's all, that's all the creator. And I will pray for this section right here because you're like, ah, uh, ah, uh, really blinding. <laughs> it's good to be with you this morning. The... Folks, the young, particularly the young folks that were baptized, everyone that's going to be baptized today, and believe it or not, we have baptisms in every one of our three services this morning. Every baptism that happens today is actually 
the fulfillment of Jesus' words in John chapter 5. So let me, let me key in on some phrases for you. What happened with these people that entered the waters of baptism and rose from these waters? Well, number one, they really did hear a word from God. That's what compelled them to come to the waters of baptism. That they heard God speak to their lives, their hearts. I couldn't have said it better than Penny. I felt God called me to this. They have heard. And that's where it all begins. That's where faith journey really begins. That's where your faith journey and my faith journey really begins. It's, it begins by God taking the initiative to open the eyes of our hearts, to open our ears that we might hear his voice. That's where it starts. I, I don't know about you, but as a, as a person of faith and as a follower of Christ, there are seasons in my life where, I don't know if you've experienced this, I call them wilderness seasons, where it, it doesn't, I, I just struggle to hear and make, to hear God's voice and make sense of what he's doing in my life. And so it's very important, right, to connect and to hear God's voice. But I've learned that even though I may not feel anything or may not necessarily hear anything, God is faithful. And while even I, I'm sometimes faithless, he still is faithful. He will guide. He does speak. He does bring life. The other thing that happened is not just they heard from God, but they also have believed and trusted in Jesus and all that God has done for them in Jesus Christ. They believed. I'm going to unpack that because that word in our culture today means lots of different things. And then finally, as we have made the theme of this morning, they've passed from death to life. They have died to their old ways. They have been liberated Delivered, set free, all the words that you've heard and that we sang this morning from the ravages of sin. I unpacked that word on Friday night, but just really briefly. When you hear the word sin, many of you are like, oh, okay, here we go. Sin. But let me just tell you, again, it's simply sin. The word literally means that we all fall short of God's intended purpose for our life. We all fall short of God's intended design. And because of that, because of that, our relationship with God is fractured. But you didn't need some pastor to yell that at you on a Sunday morning. You knew that inside your heart. You know that there is something amiss in our hearts. This is what sin has done to us. It has driven us from God's presence. It has bent us. From away from God and away from each other and towards ourselves. Sin has marred our lives. It has left us hollow and empty. And this is what Jesus came to deliver us from. This is what it means to pass from death to life. So let me take one at a time. And uh, I'm hoping that in some way God will speak the gospel, not to your ears only, but to your heart this morning. Where does it begin? Well, by hearing. And by hearing, I mean that you and I and the people that were baptized, we begin to ponder. We begin to explore, discover who Jesus actually is and what he has done. And just by way of review, we believe, and we affirm this on Friday night, that Jesus is God come to us in the flesh. He is simultaneously the son of man. He is fully human, and he is the son of God. He is fully divine. Every time I speak that truth, there's a part of my brain that goes... Bleh, bleh. Because it is absolutely mysterious as it is miraculous that God would come to you and to me as one of us. Taking on all the frailties of humanity without sin. This is the witness 
of the scriptures. Now, I know that for in our culture today and in different circles, Jesus can be a lot of things to a lot of people. Oh, Jesus, who do you believe Jesus to be? Well, he's a prophet. Oh, well, he's a good moral teacher. He's a great example. And while that might be partially true, he is infinitely more than any of those titles. He is God come to us as one of us to rescue us, to heal us, restore us, to save us from the ravages of sin. This is not a creed of a church. This is actually the words of Scripture, who Jesus is and what he has done. John chapter 5, verse 18, listen to this. This, this is why the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, Jesus, because not, because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. That's Jesus' claim. That he is God, come to us in the flesh. Now, it leaves very little room for debate here in that you're going to end up in one of two camps. You're going to say, by faith, I may not fully understand that, but I believe it. I believe that Jesus is God, come to us in the flesh. Or you got to say this, Jesus is a dude that lost his mind. There is no in-between. And I, you know... I, I think, because I hear a lot, well, he's kind of, sort of, but not really. But uh, you could do that dance all day long. But his words stand true. Either you believe them and accept them or you don't. It calls for a temerity of soul and character to embrace this truth. Peter, in his opening line of his second letter, says, Simon Peter, a servant and apostle to Jesus, of Jesus Christ, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God. Now, who's, who's he re making reference to? Righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The apostolic witness of the early church is that Jesus is God in the flesh. Probably if I was going to pick a text that will scramble our brains and affirm this great truth that Jesus is actually God come in the flesh. It's Colossians chapter 1. Listen to this. This is talking about Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. Now, if you're not familiar with Scripture, you, a question should at this point arise in your mind. Well, wait a second. In Genesis chapter 1, it says God created everything. And here in Colossians, it's saying that it was Jesus. Yeah, that's the point, that Jesus is God come to us in the flesh. You might recall the creation narrative in Genesis. How did God actually create? It says this, right, that God said, dot, 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 let there be light, and there was light. Let the firmament be brought forth, and let there be a separation from the waters of the heavens and the earth, and, and that happened. God, God created through speech his word. Now, here's where it gets absolutely mind-boggling for me. That word wasn't just a vocal sound. That word was the Son of God himself come in the flesh. John chapter 1. And the word was with God and the word was God. And the word became flesh. That's who Jesus is. Now this leaves us with some, should leave us with some serious pause. What do we do with this? Well, for those that are followers of Jesus, you have by faith, embrace this truth, and Jesus is your Lord and Savior. But let me speak just for a minute. For those, perhaps, that you're here this morning, you're sort of like, well, Grammy wants me to come to church, so that's why I'm here. Oh, no one's like that? Oh, okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, we come for all kinds of reasons. It's Easter. Maybe it's a religious tradition. We have, on this day, we have many Christers, Christmas, Easter, um, and that's when you come to church. And I'm not making fun of that. I, I don't... But I want to take a moment just to push on something here. 
maybe perhaps it's time for you to consider actually what you believe and who you trust. Maybe this Easter, for you, the next step in your faith journey is to ask those kinds of questions. What do you really believe about God? What do you really believe about his son, Jesus Christ? Because let me tell you, culture is not going to encourage you to ask those kinds of questions. Our culture will encourage the opposite. It really doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe, as if belief was some kind of magical thing, some mystical thing. All the time ignoring as irrelevant the centrality of faith in the human heart. What you believe shapes how you live. What you believe shapes how you speak. What you believe directs the trajectory of your life. Don't tell me what you believe is irrelevant or does it matter. We're talking about core issues of being human. And so that's the step. Maybe today, this morning, you may not understand everything that's going on, but maybe you feel now, I really do need to examine what I believe. And our prayer is always when people do that, whether it's you come on a Sunday and you engage for a little while and you're sort of checking things out. Like we, we like to say this all the time. We just lean in and listen. And you're, something happens when you explore your belief. When you seek to explore the claims of Christ. When you, when you dive into scripture. When you gather around as the church and we sing and we worship. We don't, sometimes we don't understand everything. But as we pursue and we seek understanding in what we believe, something happens. In the human heart. I've seen it hundreds and thousands of times in people's lives. And I could try to put words to it, but I think the Apostle Paul says it right. This is what happens when you set your heart and mind to seek the truth. When you explore the claims of Jesus Christ. When you ask God to show you, to open your eyes. This is what happens. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6. Just listen to the words. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness... When did he say that? When did God say, let there be light? Genesis 1, right? So notice what Paul's doing here. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That's what happens. That's what happens when you explore. That's what happens when you open, you ask God to open your heart, open your mind to truth to the truth of who Jesus is and what he has done for you. God comes in in the same way in Genesis 1. He said, let there be light, and there was light. He comes into your heart and my heart, and he says, let there be light. And all of a sudden, we see who God is and what he's done for us in Jesus. Now, everyone, I, I'm looking around the room, and for those that have experienced that miracle, that encounter, you're going like this. Right? You're like, I know exactly what he's talking about. Because I was over here in some place, and my life was this, and I was struggling and all that. And I just, I, man, I, I just threw up a prayer. I said, God, help me. I believe, help me to believe in what you've done. Help me to believe in Jesus. And in that instant, God spoke to their heart and said, let there be light. And then there are others of you that are listening, and you're like, Say what? It really does happen. Lives are changed. That's the testimony. The old is gone. The new has come. Do you feel like you need something new in your life? Better yet, do you feel like you need a new heart? A new life? This is where it begins. It's not just this commitment to explore faith and belief, and to ask God to reveal himself to you and to show you the truth, but it's also a confession. 
These folks that were baptized this morning are making a profession, a confession of faith and trust. This is what I call the believe part of John 5, that they actually believe. Now, you got to be careful here because when you say believe, lots of different sort of definitions and pictures come into our minds. Sometimes belief is relegated to the mind, to the cognitive abilities of the mind. In other words, belief is about believing the right facts, the right truths. And that's important. Truth is important, especially today, where it seems like truth is whatever anyone wants it to be, which, how can I say this respectfully, is insane. It is absolutely insane to say that there is truth, but that very truth is whatever you want it to be. So what the truth is for you, that's true for you. And what the truth is for me, that's true for me. That's crazy. I hope you see that. It's like me saying, see this? You think it's a table. This, to me, is an elephant. (laughs) And not only is it an elephant, but you must nod in agreement with me that I see this as an elephant. It looks like a table, but to me, the truth is that this is an elephant. You see how illog- You see how crazy? That's crazy. But we're getting fed a constant diet, aren't we? Of crazy. Our children are being fed a constant diet of crazy. <laughs> And so I want to be clear that belief is more than some kind of doctrine you embrace with your head. Belief is even more. So let's go to the other side. Belief is more than feeling. Now, feeling is important. I'm a feeler. Many of you guys that come to Grace know that I, I, I cry at the drop of a hat. I cry at puppy commercials. I, do. I'm, I like to feel. When I come to church, I don't want to be there stoic. God is good. You know. I want to feel stuff. When I sing, I want to feel the presence of God. When the word is being proclaimed, I want to sense God's presence, that he is near me, that he loves me. I want to feel. There's absolutely nothing wrong with feeling. But here, faith is more than even feeling. Because there are going to be seasons, as I just described a little while ago, and you might be in one right now where you feel nothing except the driving beat of life's responsibilities. God is nowhere to be felt in your existence. And so you've confused that feeling with, I guess I have no faith because I don't feel. No. Faith transcends thoughts as it transcends feelings. Paul, again, helps us here in Romans chapter 10. He says this. This is the confession. If you confess with your mouth, that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For Now, here's the important line. Everybody knows, this is a, the first line, verse 9, is a very popular verse, and a lot of people know it. But here's the one that really gets me, verse 10. For with the heart one believes and is justified, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. So you see, there's a dual confession going on here, much like everyone that entered the waters There was a confession, a verbal confession that you heard with the mouth, right? You heard him say it. Have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Yes. Will you promise to follow him all the days of your life? Yes. There's a verbal confession that all believers make. This is our confession of the mouth. But notice here there's a secondary and corollary confession. It's the confession of the heart. Now, How does the heart confess? But sir, it doesn't have lips or mouth. Thank you, Jesus. Especially for me. I know my heart. How does how does a heart, how does your heart confess what it clings to or what it believes? How does your heart confess? It confesses by its very life. How you live is the confession of your heart. 
How you live is the confession of faith from your heart. Jesus himself here, Jesus himself says, it is out of the heart that the mouth speaks. Whatever is in here, whatever you believe in here is going to show out here. I don't care how hard you try to hide it. It's going to show. See, belief is not just head. It's not just heart. Belief is trusting your whole life. Head, heart, body, soul to Jesus Christ. That's faith. That's what these folks have done. They have pledged to give the rest of their lives to submit completely to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, you get out of the water, are they going to be perfect? Uh Uh-uh. Some of them were really young. They're not perfect. Uh, Will they stumble? Okay, so those of you that got baptized... Look at me. You got baptized. Praise God. That is absolutely wonderful. You're going to walk out of these doors, and maybe next week sometime, I'm being very gracious, you're going to say something or do something that's just not good. Right? What does that mean? Does that mean the baptism didn't take? I was, I was uh, joking around with some of, the, some of our young folks that were getting baptized this morning, and I went up to one little girl, and I go, are you getting baptized? Mm-hmm. I said, you know what, I'm going to tell your parents to hold you under just a little while longer, you know, so that it really takes. And then, of course, I, she's looking at me like, I was like, I'm, I'm just kidding. But let's remind ourselves, when we walk out of here, if you were baptized and you falter and you sin and you fail, does that mean the baptism didn't take? No, because it's not dependent on your ability. It is dependent on the faithfulness of God. In Jesus Christ. That's what we're trusting in. So we submit all of life. We endeavor. And it's a struggle. Let me tell you something. It's a struggle to trust God. In all the various ways that he calls us to trust him. With our bodies. With our jobs. With our children. With our money. With everything. And we, and we uh, because we're, we're uh, I don't want to give that up. I I'm not sure that God knows even what he's doing here. I, 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 let me hold on to that. And it's a struggle. But that is the struggle of faith. It's trust. So who do you trust in? Who do you entrust your well-being to? Your body, your mind, your children, your marriage, your job. Who do you entrust those things to? Last thing. All of this is great. But none of this was designed to be done as a solo project. One of our core values here at Grace is faith is not a solo project. And what we mean to say by that is that we do this together because we all need help, right? This is not, there's a reason why we don't baptize in some back room privately just the person and a pastor. There's a reason for that. It's because this is not just a celebration of what God has done in their life, but it's the celebration of them joining a much larger family of faith. That's what it means to place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ is not for you to figure it out on your own it is to join in with the family of God now when I say that some of y'all looking at me like "Mm mm-hmm church been there done that they're crazy people I don't go to church because of the people I'm just me and Jesus that's great except that this is nowhere in scripture You are called by Christ, saved by Christ, to be part of Christ's body, his family. Two things. Every family has a crazy uncle. Think about it. We're celebrating Easter. There's going to be get-togethers. There's going to be family. There's going to be lots of food. And there's a crazy uncle. Every family has the crazy uncle. And if you are thinking, uh, my family doesn't have the crazy uncle, you're the crazy uncle. <laughs> Everybody has it. That's what it means to be family. It's not that we're perfect. It's not that we never fail or falter or hurt each other or fight. That's family. Church is no different. It's no different. But let me, let me split this hair just a little more. Yes. We're a family. We're family by grace. 
We're family by faith in Jesus. But let's acknowledge sometimes in the very place where we should together encourage and admonish and support each other, this is the very place where people get wounded and betrayed. That's a real thing. So I understand. I'm not minimizing that. And my word to you is you may have been hurt at the hands of a pastor, priest, rabbi, or bishop, or other religious leader. And that has so twisted you on the inside that you just, I'm done. I'm done. Maybe this Easter, maybe this very morning, God is telling you, yes, you were done with that whole situation. Let's get it behind it. But I need you to come back. I need you to come home. I am not justifying whatever hurts and pains you've experienced at the hands of the church, whichever church. But let me just tell you, as imperfect as we are as people, it is grace that holds us together. And so if you've been hurt and betrayed, let me tell you this. Let's, let's acknowledge that. But don't get stuck there. Move on. Find a community. If you're watching online, find a community that will support and encourage faith, that will walk alongside you. Don't become jaded because of the imperfections and the sinfulness that you see in humanity because Christ died even for that, to make his bride pure. Ephesians chapter 2, I'll close here. So when you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow, fellow citizens with the saints and members of God's household, built on a foundation of apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. This is who we, we are. This is family in the truest sense of that word. You do not have to live and do life on your own because God is faithful and he will walk with you and he's provided a family. With all the warps, warts and bumps and bruises, he's provided a family where you can come and share life and faith. Lord, be with us this Easter morning. Help us one more time to embrace more fully all that you have done, all that we've considered this morning. And I pray especially for those that perhaps this morning they're going to take just one simple step. They're going to examine themselves and what they believe. I pray for others this morning that perhaps they've just lost their way a little bit. Life got busy and you've been pushed to the margins of their life. I pray Lord, let them clearly hear now your voice calling them back into your very arms. I pray for those that have been walking with you and will continue to walk with you, that you will strengthen them, that you renew their hope, that you would keep your promise of eternal life alive in their heart and soul. Do this for the glory of your name and the good of your people. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God bless you this morning.
alone to serve the glory, the honor and the praise. Lord Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. The risen Lord is coming back one day. We worship him forever.
thank you for joining us this morning. As you go, we have a gift for you as you go in the lobby. There's potted plants all over the lobby and they are for you to take. So go ahead and take those another way out. Be careful in the parking lot because the next service is starting to show up early because they're excited to celebrate with us. But what are we celebrating? We're celebrating that God has seen us, that he has sent his one and only son to our rescue, and that on the cross, he paid the penalty for our sins so that we could have grace of God, right standing with the Father. And he rose from the grave. He conquered death on our behalf. He reigns in heaven at the right hand of the Father, and he is coming back soon. So as you go and as you grab those plants and you see the new life springing up this spring, be reminded of the new life that we have. But don't be blind. There's a life waiting for us. And when Jesus comes back and we will all be celebrating like this except greater in heaven, go and celebrate Easter with your family. Thank you for joining us.